Hi, welcome to the 8th Wall Payments tutorial. In this tutorial, I'll be guiding you through all of the steps you need to add secure payments to your 8th Wall apps. Monetization is a key challenge for web developers, and to solve this, we launched 8th Wall Payments. 8th Wall Payments gives developers the tools they need to add secure payments to their AR and VR web apps. Developers can use the Payments module found in the Cloud Editor to easily add products for purchase in their project. All payments are facilitated by the 8th Wall Payments API, which enables developers to collect and receive payments. I will walk you through the steps to get started with the 8th Wall Payments, including setting up your account, how to use the Payments module in your project, and a look at our Access Pass sample project designed for paid access to a project for a limited period of time. To start, you'll need to onboard your account to the 8th Wall Payments platform. This can be done by navigating to the Account Settings page on the 8th Wall Developer Portal. Scroll down to the bottom of the page to the Payments API section. Here, you'll find a dropdown that allows you to select your home country. The onboarding process varies slightly depending on the country you're from and the information that you'll have to provide to onboard. In this case, we'll select the United States. Once you start, you'll be directed to Stripe to securely facilitate your identity and information collection. 8th Wall uses Stripe to collect all of this identity verification information securely. Continue through the Stripe onboarding flow and provide all of the information that it requests. After you've completed the onboarding, once you return to the 8th Wall account settings, you'll see that the information that you have provided will appear on this page. In some cases, the verification process may take a few days to complete, but during that time, you can still start integrating 8th Wall payments into your app. We'll start by cloning the Access Pass sample project. This project uses APIs provided by the Payments module to provide paid access to a virtual experience for a limited amount of time. You'll notice in the file tree to the left that there's a module section. This module section contains one module, which is the Payments module. This is automatically added to the project that you had cloned because it integrates with the Payments API. If, however, you have a project that you'd like to add the Payments API integration to, you can still see the modules section on the left, but you'd click the plus button, then click on the Payments module, and import that module directly into your project. Both use cases still give you access to the APIs in the module. And so now let's go back to the Access Pass sample project that we cloned. In this project, we can see the integration of the module within the access pass modal file. You'll notice the import statement at the top. This import statement is directly accessing the APIs that are provided by the module. You'll notice that the module that you're importing from has the same exact name as the label that appears on the left sidebar in the module section. This is how you access uh, APIs from modules in general. So the way that this integrates with the Payments API is using the Access Pass API provided by the Payments module. This Access Pass API has one function that we can call, which is request purchase if needed. What this API does is it will check to see if a user has made a purchase for your content in the past. If they haven't, then we will open a secure session to the 8th Wall checkout page. This will allow users to securely enter their credit card information and purchase access to your content. If they have made a purchase in the past though, then it'll completely skip that checkout session and it'll allow users to go directly to the virtual experience that you've created. Now let's go back to the actual payments module. You'll notice that there's a few different configurations that exist inside of this module. Let's talk through the two different groups of configurations that exist. The first are the test mode configurations. These configurations are used when developing the integration with the Payments API. The first is the test mode enabled. As the name suggests, this basically determines whether or not we are using a test mode of the Payments API or a production mode of the Payments API. The difference between the two is that the production mode API requires that users enter real credit card information. The test mode API, however, doesn't allow real credit card information to be entered. Instead, it simply skips that process and just allows you to simulate successful and failed payment events so you can test out both use cases inside of your application. The second field in this group is clear test purchases on run. As I mentioned previously, 
the API will typically check to see if a user has made a purchase in the past. This field will allow you to clear the purchases that you have made in test mode on each refresh. And so that way, even if your app typically allows users access to your, to your experience for say one to seven days, in test mode, it'll clear those purchases so that you can continuously test the integration without really having to wait for that amount of time. The next group that we have is the access pass defaults. Uh, the access pass defaults are the values that are used by the API that we have used inside of this project. More specifically, this request access if needed API. And so these defaults allow you to specify all of the default parameters without actually having to specify those in the function call themselves. So let's go through these one by one as well. The first is the access pass name. And so this name is essentially the name that appears on the checkout page for the users who are purchasing access to your experience. And so in this case, we have named this access pass or one day access pass. But what does this look like in the checkout page? Let's take a look. So if we preview our project as is right now, you'll notice this paywall that I had mentioned earlier. When I click access now, that's triggering the request purchase if needed API uh, that we had discussed earlier. And so one of the things you'll notice is that the product is the name that we have provided inside of this access pass name. And so you'll see that the one day access pass matches the product name that appears on this confirmation screen. And so if we were to change that value, it would change inside of this sample inside of the screen as well. And so let's say that I have an experience that I would like to last for multiple days instead of just one day. And so let's rename this pass to a two day access pass. And so moving on to the next field is the access duration in days. By default, this project is a single day access. And so as I had mentioned earlier, the API that we are using will check to see if previous purchases have been made. This field here is determining how far back we check to see if a past purchase has been made. And so when it's one, we're basically checking to see if a user has made a purchase in the last 24 hours. However, if we change this to two, we're now saying that when a person purchases access to your experience, they now don't have to pay for the next two days to access the content that you have created in your project. And so now let's save and build this. And let's see how this has affected the, the checkout page. That updates the two days access that we have here. And then if we try to access the project, we get the checkout screen that now also has the updated fields. And so you'll see that the product has been named two day access and the amount of time that it's valid for has also been updated to two days. And so these values can be changed to essentially whatever it is that best fits your experience. For example, let's say we have a virtual concert that we want people to have access to for a single day. This can be named virtual concert experience. And this can be a single day. And so whatever it is that you decide to change, that would be reflected in the checkout page. Now, by default, this project has a price of $9.99 USD. And so this is configurable to be whatever it is that you would like to charge uh, your customers. We do, at the moment, only support USD currencies and Japanese yen currencies. And each has their appropriate minimum and maximum amounts, which you can find on our documentation page. But let's say that we would like to charge 99 cents instead. And so if we're charging USD, you can simply type in the decimal amount that you would like here where the value to the left of the decimal is the actual dollar amount, and the value to the right of the decimal is the cents. And so if I wanted to charge 99 cents, 0 0.99 is what I would enter here. The currency, which is which in this case I'm, I'm hoping to use United States dollars, would just be USD. And so if I were to save and build this, and then preview my project again, uh, we'll notice that this essentially gets propagated across the board and so you'll see that inside of the paywall, we now have two days, which should be updated to, and access for 99 cents. And if we try to access this project, it's 99 cents here as well as for the total price. Uh, and finally, we have uh, the, the checkout page language. So one of the things that I had mentioned is that the currencies that we currently support are United States dollars and Japanese yen. 
And so if you're trying to charge Japanese yen, it's very likely that you're targeting a, a Japanese audience. And so in this case, if you're building an experience that isn't necessarily supported for, say, English users, one of the, one of the uh, flags that we support is uh, localization for the checkout page. And so one of the languages that we support is US English, but the other is uh, Japanese. And so if we wanted to target, let's say, a Japanese audience for our experience, uh, we'd be able to modify these parameters to, uh, to target that. And so if, let's say, rather than 99 cents, I would like to charge 99 yen, I'd type 99 here, JPY for Japanese yen in the currency, and for the checkout page language, I would type JA-JP, which is the locale code for Japanese. And so let's save and build again and see how this updates our project. We've updated the checkout page language to, Japanese, uh, to the Japanese language. What you'll notice is that this paywall is still mostly in English, even though it does have the Japanese yen as the currency that we're going to be charged. The reason for this is that that field only affects the checkout page. And so if you are targeting a locale other than English, you still do need to make sure that your application itself is built for that specific language. That being said, if we were to go to the checkout page, you'll notice that this now appears in Japanese as opposed to English. And so depending on the type of locale that you're targeting, you'll be able to customize the checkout page for whatever project needs you have. Now, let's change this back to English. So let's take a look at the checkout page again. One of the things I had mentioned is the distinction between test mode and production mode. And so in test mode, we don't actually require users to enter in any credit card information. And you'll be able to tell the difference between test mode and production mode via the banner that we have at the top of this page, which mentions test mode, as well as the UI placeholder uh, for whether credit card information is typically collected. And so in a real experience, you wouldn't see that banner at the top, and users would see a real input field here where they would enter in one of their various payment methods. However, if you're just developing your application, in most cases, you really only need to be able to simulate a failed payment or a successful payment. And this will allow you to kind of handle both cases uh, depending on the type of credit card that your users will enter into uh, the checkout page. And so in order to test those two different uh, experiences out, we have two different buttons at the bottom of the page. These two buttons only appear in test mode. In production, you would just have a typical submit button, which would uh, charge the, the credit card information that was input in those fields above. And so let's say that we're first trying to test out a failed payment. The way that we would do that is by simply test by clicking this failed payment button. And so let's do that. When I click that, you'll notice that the checkout page closes, and then I'm sent back to the actual application that I was developing for. You'll see an error message that appears, which says incomplete purchase. Please try again. In these cases, this will show an error that corresponds to the actual error that a user has received. And so in production, uh, these would actually be more specific error messages. For example, it could be insufficient funds, uh, a bank rejecting a charge, etc. But in test mode, we essentially say incomplete purchase. Regardless of the type of error, your application should still be able to handle those failed uh, those failed experiences and display some sort of error state. In this sample project, we've essentially built that out for you. Now, let's test out what a successful payment would look like. And so if we were to click Access Now, we still get the same checkout page. Um, but instead of clicking the failed payment, let's click the successful payment button. In this case, you'll see a confirmation page. And so in production, users would actually see a real order number uh, the real payment method that they have entered, the date that they have entered, uh, and essentially a confirmation of the purchase that they have made with the option to print that out for their own records. Once the user closes this page, you'll, they'll be sent back to the actual experience and be given access to the experience itself. And so what you'll notice in this sample project is as soon as I have completed a successful purchase, I have now gotten past that paywall and I am now in an experience where I get to see this hologram. And so if I were to tap 
to place this hologram, I'll now see these two virtual dancers. Or one of the configurations that I did mention earlier was this clear test purchases on run. And so typically with a real purchase, when users refresh the page, they wouldn't have to see the checkout page again. But in test mode, when I have this flag enabled, what you'll notice is that if I try to access the experience again, I'm sent back to the checkout page. This is so that you can continue to test those failed and successful payment events. But let's say that you're pretty confident that you've handled both of these cases and you want to test what a real production purchase would be like. Simply turn off this flag and rebuild your experience. And so if I go through a successful payment, I gain access to the experience. Now, if I were to refresh the page and I try to access the experience again, what you'll notice is that I'm not actually sent to the checkout page. I just get direct access to this experience. And so in production, this is what your users would actually experience. They make a purchase to access your application and subsequent attempts to access that application will give them direct access to this content. In this tutorial, we walked through how to set up your account for the 8th Wall Payments platform, how to add the payments module into one of your applications, and how to configure the Access Pass sample project for your own project needs. We can't wait to see what you're able to build with these APIs, and please make sure to tag 8th Wall on social so that we can help share your experiences.